Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another exciting, magnificent, perfect episode of You Missed It. Uh, tonight it is we've come around to me again, and today I have chosen the movie Ed Wood. Ed Wood was uh, directed by Tim Burton and starring Johnny Depp. Um, now, before uh, I get on with the episode, just want a quick little shout out to our social media. Uh, just to let you know if you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, SoundCloud, YouTube, and iTunes. Just look up "You Missed It" and you'll you'll find it somewhere. Um, give us a like, share, get us all out there, folks. Help us out. Um, so, anyways, um, we we're about to today. We watched Ed Wood. Now, Ed Wood is one of my all-time favorite movies. It's in my top ten. It's been one of my favorite movies. Oh God, since I was a teenager when I started getting into filmmaking. So this was like the perfect movie. Uh, to get around to and to really uh, inspire me and make me want to make movies. It's, every time I watch it, I instantly want to make movies. It's mm-hmm. always had that effect on me. Um, the movie, uh, of course, I said was uh, directed by Tim Burton, and it was uh, stars uh, Johnny Depp, Martin Lando, Sarah Jessica Parker, Pat- Patricia Arquette, and Bill Murray. Um, it was produced by Touchstone, Pi- uh, Touchstone Pictures, which is the uh, subdivision of Disney, um, Touchstone was kind of like their studio that Disney gave pictures that they didn't want under the Disney brand, whether it was too adult or whatever. Um, it was budgeted at $18 million. Um, however, it only brought in 5.9. Um, so it was a box office disappointment. However, it was received critical acclaim and was loved by critics. In fact, uh, Gene Siskel famously said that this was, this should be required viewing for all film students. It was nominated for two Oscars, winning two Oscars, including Best Supporting Actor for Martin Lando for Bela Lugosi, beating the likes of uh, Samuel L. Jackson from mm-hmm. uh, for playing uh, Jules from uh, Pulp Fiction, yep. and then some, and uh, Lieutenant Dan from uh, uh, Forrest, Gump. Forrest Gump. Gary yeah. Sinise. Gary Sinise, yep. Yeah. Uh, they all lost to- Poor uh, Lieutenant Dan. Yeah, Lieutenant Dan. Or the guy from uh, CSI New York. That's actually where I first saw him in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I, I love this movie. It's, it's, I can't really, I don't really have anything negative to say about it. I think the music's fantastic. I think the acting is great. The directing is great. The cinematography is, in my opinion, one of the best black and white movies I still think I've ever seen. And, uh, yeah, no, I, I want to hear what y'all think about it. So we'll start with, uh, Rylan. All right. Well, I have had the privilege of, uh, watching this movie before with Jack, um, I mean, we, we we live together, so it's pretty uh, it, it's pretty inescapable. I've definitely seen it once all the way through, and then but between all the little bits and pieces, he keeps going back to it. I've probably seen it about the total of another time yeah. <laughs> uh, before then, so I, I am quite familiar with this one. But uh, it's always a pleasure to watch it again because it is uh, it is a fantastic film. Um, I don't know if you mentioned yet that Ed Wood is based on a real person, or is a real person, for yes. uh, oh, those yeah. who don't know. For those who don't know, Ed Wood uh, is, is a bio, bio, biography about a real-life uh, filmmaker named Edward D. Wood Jr., who is infamous, infamously known for making some of the worst movies, quote-unquote, worst movies of all time. Uh, I have seen a couple of his movies, and... They definitely live up to the uh, to the title in terms of like, oh yeah, these are they're interesting to watch. If uh, if you if you are a fan of schlock B movie trash or just bad movies that are so entertaining, you can't help but watch them. These are like this the originators of that. These are like the gold standard of like bad movies so yeah yeah. so basically this movie is about the making of those movies and following the character of the 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 writer director producer and sometimes star uh ed wood who is played by uh, johnny depp in this movie um uh, johnny depp gives a absolutely like magnetic performance as this guy like you're just you're just drawn in by his wide-eyed enthusiasm and excitement and passion for everything uh now this is a guy who who has uh saying he has a love for film seems to be uh, a pretty tremendous understatement. Uh, he's, he's, he's basically, he has a, a love and a, an almost, almost like divine admiration for the, the art of filmmaking. And he's so excited to, to, to fight for the opportunities to make some himself, but he has, he's so, he's so all out of his element is the point. He has no clue what he's doing. 
Um, but he has a great time doing it, and his enthusiasm is is so contagious, and he manages to he, it manages to get it done one way or the other. So it's fascinating to watch how these exploits play out, and and like I said, the whole time you're just you're just drawn in, like you know this is gonna be that these movies are a pile of shit, but you're still you're still rooting for him because he's just he's just over the moon. And like Jack was saying, this is a beautiful movie as well, um, with the black and white. Um, I mean, like most Tim Burton movies, pretty much are black and white, anyways, even when they are in color. So it's uh it's probably just as well that. Uh, He's uh, utilizing the uh, monochromatic uh, media here, and I like how it. To me, the film, um, it was it. A lot of it was um, not just the black and white, but the way it was shot, the way it was edited. It, it felt a lot like um, a 1950s piece, which is the time that even the, the movie was made in '94. But it feels like it was set in the in the 1950s while you're watching it. But uh, yeah, very entertaining. Sorry, I'm rambling a little bit, kind of hitting the same points over again, but. Definitely, this is definitely a good movie. So let's hear what other people have to think about it. Yeah, now I'll mention one other thing about the the black and white photography is that that wasn't um, a little bit of a trivia fact for for those out there. Is that this movie was decided to be shot in black and white because they couldn't uh, get Bela Lugosi to look right in color mm. because he's he had never been in a color film. So trying to get his because the whole uh, Martin Lando his entire face is covered in makeup mm-hmm. to make him look like. Uh, Bella go see and they were saying this doesn't look right and then all of a sudden he held um, they had an old photograph a black and white photograph of Bella go see and it and there's like this is what it looks like so they decide we're gonna shoot in black and white hmm. and this was originally going to be actually distributed by Columbia Pictures but when they decided to shoot in black and white they slashed the budget in half hmm. and then eventually they actually uh, put the movie on a turnaround which that means that see if any other studios will take it from them because they didn't want to put the money into it and Bona Vista Studios, Disney bought it and did shell out the budget, but the budget was sliced in half. It was originally going to be like the 30s, and then of course now it's in the under 20 because it was needed to be shot in black well, and white. Given the box office return, I suppose that was just as well. But I'm shocked that there was that much of a discrepancy. Like that seems crazy. To me. Oh, it's it's it, it, black and white. Like throughout, like since the 60s, has always been box office poison because no one wants to go see it. It's very rare for a movie to come out nowadays that was shot in black and white to be a financial success like we can only probably name a few off the top of our heads like schindler's list yeah, uh the artist any um even sin city to to an extent to a degree to, an extent, to a degree yeah. but that one kind of took the idea and ran with it yeah um but yeah it's, but besides that not many do wonders in the box box office so i don't blame them but artistically i i can't see this in color this, yeah, this would be impossible. Like I've seen some behind the scenes footage of mm. of this movie in color. It just looks off. Mm. Looks really weird. The sets, um, because all these movies are reenacting uh, scenes from the movies that 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 they're making of, like Plan Nine, Bride of the Monster, or um, Glenn or Glenda, is that those movies were also shot in black and white. So they accurately look closer to what the the original sets look like because you've only seen black and white photos. If you mm. see the color. It wouldn't look the same. It would feel a little off. So, mm. yeah, no. It, the, to me, this was one of those movies that needed to be shot in black and white. But anyways, um, Zach. Yeah. Um, so, of course, I had seen it. Um, of course, Jack had shown it to me, too. Seems <laughs> to be the one that is showing us all this movie because it is underrated. and Not a lot of people do talk about it. And, uh, yeah, it's it's really good. Um, you know, I, I do love the choice of shooting in black and white. I mean, with that trivia, it makes a lot of sense, too. But I just, I like that style of it. it. I mean, it fits the period, right? It just kind of makes sense anyways. And not a lot of films, especially in the 90s and up, shoot in black and white. It's like considered an odd choice, right? I mean, why not shoot in color? Um, but it makes perfect sense, you know, in this uh, in this film. Um, and the cinematography was gorgeous and everything too, so it paid off. Um, I thought the performances are also fantastic too. Uh, both the, uh, you know, like Johnny Depp, is fantastic as Ed Wood. And what was the actor's name? Martin Lando. Yeah, Martin Lando. Yeah, he was great as Bella oh, Lugosi. Like, I totally fantastic. get He actually recently passed away not too long ago. So I thought I heard something. Yeah, yeah. it's too bad. No, he's uh, he's great. And it's yeah. it's really like, um, for those who like who don't know what Martin Lando and Bella Lugosi look like, when you put a side-by-side picture of the two actors, yeah. they look nothing alike. Yeah. And 
that's why this movie won best makeup at the Oscars mm-hmm. uh, because to transform him to make him look like this old Hungarian actor who's also a drug mm-hmm. addict and a famous Hungarian actor yeah. as well as famous as Dracula it's it's commendable it's great no exactly it's it's amazing really because you kind of look at it on the screen you're like that's Bela Lugosi like it's it's insane um but yeah I just I just love how they captured Ed Wood and just his undying spirit you know like it you know no matter what he was always kind of pushing forward you know no matter what was thrown at him and stuff like Mm -hmm. that and you know it's really commendable um so I I love that side and they kind of you know kept with that the whole time um despite you know what uh, Sarah Jessica Parker says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um but yeah, no overall though I do really like the movie. I think it's very under uh very underrated and yeah. All right. Now uh on to Andrew. Now Andrew, you're the only one out of the four of us who had who has never seen this movie up until now. Um I have a one other question to add to this. Um after seeing this movie, do you actually want to see some of Ed Wood's actual movies? Uh yeah, so um to answer that question just one like i would just watch the one like that is so all all that's yeah the just uh plan plan nine from outer space Mm. that seems to be the only one that i would be willing to because i know they're all gonna be like bad b movies and that's all fine and good and fun but Mm -hmm. like i don't know that i would actually be able to like bring myself to watch numerous movies from him because i know it's gonna still be kind of like i can't watch it by myself no. no, that's the thing, right? I could watch the one Plan Nine from Outer Space probably by myself, just to like experience it. Mm-hmm. Um, in a group, yeah, I, I could actually, yeah, I could watch more. I, mm-hmm. I'd be willing to because it might be more fun. But yeah, I'm only interested to really see the one to kind of see the the most famous one to get an idea of, of mm-hmm. why why yeah. why did it catch with audiences? Mm-hmm. Why did it get that cult status? Because I've heard of it mm-hmm. before this. Um, yeah, but I, I I came into this movie not knowing any like anything about any of the subject matter. To be honest, I didn't know anything about Ed Wood. I didn't know besides the the film's name. I didn't know uh, any of his movies. I just recognized that one title. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I, I it's completely fresh experience for me. Yeah, no, um, I had I had actually a, um a, one of the unique uh opportunities to. I have seen all I knew about Ed Wood. I had seen all his movies before I saw Ed Wood, mm. the, like the movie. Um, so I knew about Planet Nine from Outer Space. I knew about Glenn or Glenda. I actually had seen both of those movies That's neat. before I saw Ed That's Wood. Cool. So seeing them recreate um, the movies, I was like, this is really cool. And just how mm. dead on they were mm. with almost when you watch a side by side, it's eerie how close they are. It's I always have a problem with some movies about that are about making mo- about making movies and they're trying to recreate scenes and mm-hmm. they you know it's not right yeah something's off and someone who are someone who's a fan of the movie will immediately pick that off but with this one it's like you you know that famous speech in the movie uh, where Bela Gossi gives does that monologue he does it twice he yeah. actually yeah. was very fond of that speech and he would do public um, performances of that speech in front of uh, just random people on the street. And when you when you watch the actual clip of him doing that, and just how close he got it to it, how the frame of the shot, it's it's really cool, and it shows that this movie, like with uh, with Johnny Depp's character being so passionate and so like infectious with how ex- just driven he is, you can kind of tell that um, Tim Burton felt the same way. Just mm-hmm. how how much detail is in this movie he kind of did the exact opposite of what ed would say it's like filmmaking is not about the tiny details it's about the big picture mm-hmm. it's like tim burton did the exact opposite yeah. every little detail is in this movie well, and yes it's... because it's the tiny details that make the big picture there you yeah. go yeah. anyways uh what do you think of ed wood overall yeah i so <clears throat> i don't want to be the the bad guy you here, are but like <laughs> i have a feeling so i had a feeling um because i knew that this was a movie i could immediately tell and i knew because it was coming from you guys that it was going to be like a filmmaker's movie yeah this is a movie where it's like people in the industry love this shit they like eat it right up it's the artist it's this it's it's anything about hollywood it's like done well 
that you know just it gets an a special amount of love from people who love making films mm -hmm. and are in the industry acting directing whatever right writing um i'm an outsider from that i totally am like at, uh, i'm i forever a movie lover in as an audience member always i will always be the audience i will never be like i, I will never be big into that aspect like that's not mm -hmm. my that's not what I want from film. What I want from film is the escapism. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, and the range of things you get from that. So from that perspective, um, it doesn't, I don't think it, movies like that will ever have as big an impact. Depends. Totally depends. Like I love the artist. Um, it, it, I guess it depends what the film is like. Um, I definitely enjoyed this film. I liked it a lot. Uh, I don't think I liked it as much as pretty much everybody here uh it seems that way because like I, I i'm not sure about you zach mm. i think you like it a lot i'm not sure how high it is for you but well it's not as high as jack clearly because it's like what in your top 10 of all time it's my top 10 pair of yeah so it's my, not, for me it's not that not high. even close to that but it's yeah. i but i do think it's a very good movie i i don't really see any flaws with it um, yeah it's one so, of those so at the same time i guess i would hold it pretty high because Really, there's there's no flaws, you know, as far as I can see, and I think all the performances are really good. I think it's stunning. I didn't also say that the score is also very good too by Howard Shore. Oh, the score and, is fantastic. And I was saying that revisiting the film too is that it's kind of cool that he went with Howard Shore because you're almost expecting this Danny Elfman type score. I mean, you would think he would just fit right in, right? Mm -hmm. But no, it's Howard Shore, and it gives us different feeling to it that just works even better I a think. little bit uh, less whimsy and a little bit more grandeur right. but i feel like that yeah. almost serves to highlight a little bit more how out of his depth the character of ed wood is mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i thought it was great but anyways yeah. uh so from yeah so from my perspective i uh i, I again yeah i agree with you yeah. uh i don't see i i can't pick apart any flaws that's the tough part is is yeah. uh the performances were great the score was great it was shot very it, very well it looks very uh it looks great the story was really compelling considering i knew nothing about it mm -hmm. um so i liked it a lot i i definitely liked it a lot um but there was nothing that pushed it it's 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 like the difference between a really good film like a good film and a great film oh, okay there it was missing something that makes it a great film. Mm -hmm. And the hard part about this movie is that it was so well acted and shot and I, that it's hard to pick apart what magic element it was missing mm -hmm. for me. Um, maybe it's the, so that's why I give that, that kind of intro about my perspective, because I think that might've been it. I think it might've yeah. been the fact that I don't hold such a reverence for the of, as much of a reverence for the filmmaking process as you guys do, mm -hmm. or as people or critics or anybody who's in the industry does. Just because, like, I'm looking to get to to be transported by these worlds, uh, not just by worlds, but like into people's emotional stories. So for me, the driving force of this film was uh, Ed Wood as a character, was him and uh, why does he persevere or how he gets this done and mm -hmm. and his struggles and his uh, his never ending optimism right that was what was most compelling for me mm -hmm. um there were other elements in the film that were really good like the fact of how he manages to get these film these films financed and like how how i actually one of the most compelling things i found about the film were was that it um how it portrayed uh hollywood as just being this this uh just how cannibalistic Hollywood can be. Like mm -hmm. it, it'll cannibalize whatever project you have. Like, like the fact that he would have these projects have all this I ideas for for what he wanted, and then he would just like just for f for financing or because a producer wanted this or or mm -hmm. whatever, he had to like drastically make pretty drastic changes, like name changes, actors changes. things like that. Like that's that was really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Um, so. Yeah, I liked it a lot. I just don't, I, I just, I found that story to be really well done and interesting. So I liked it a lot, but it just wasn't like masterpiece level for me or like way up there where it's like mm -hmm. one of my favorite films, just because I think uh, for movies to be at that level for me personally, uh, it has to emotionally resonate like in mm. a deep way it has to mm -hmm. be it has to be personal it's that's why uh, it's such a subjective thing uh, saying like watching film 
uh subjectively it doesn't connect with me as much as it does you guys but i liked it a lot so like mm. i don't want to like make it seem like i don't like the movie i like it a, a lot i think it's very good mm. yeah i mean that's a fair point too i mean considering mm. that a lot of us are involved with film and maybe like that spirit kind of like mm. you know bounces to yeah, us like, too like jack you were saying that like watching this movie makes you immediately want to make film mm -hmm. and that makes sense to me mm. not for me because i don't have that desire so yeah. that's missing for me and that makes sense to me like i totally get that and for that being the one disconnect is because you're not in this world uh as no. hardcore as the rest of us are no. um and how much and that and like I, I i totally get that i think that's a fair a very fair statement yeah i yeah. wonder wonder and the, and that's, how, how you're gonna feel about the disaster yeah artist. so i was literally just yeah. gonna bring that up you're on my wavelength so the reason why i'm gonna say i i will probably connect with that a lot more because uh i read the book so i know mm -hmm. yeah b b basically what's gonna show up in the film probably um and the reason why i love the book so much it's a great book mm -hmm. people should read it um is because it's uh, Tommy Wiseau to me seems like an audience member, like somebody like me who loves movies so much he wants to make them. So he is like somebody who wants to be in the industry, but he, I feel like he comes at it from like my perspective. He loves watching these films and he loves, uh, that's, that's his driving force. He loves it so much that he thought it was a great idea to make them. But I think that he is better as uh, like a movie enthusiast. Like mm -hmm. somebody, somebody who who doesn't make films, although you know, obviously, he made a great, a great, <laughs> quote you know, unquote. quotes movie. Um, you know, like, uh, but he 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 comes from that uh, perspective. I think. I think he has the same perspective, similar perspective mm -hmm. as me about film. Like, he just loves them uh, to experience them, yeah. and I think that comes across so much in the disaster artist when you look at the behind the scenes and everything, and the way mm -hmm. that he acts. And that connects with me in a big way. Everything he's saying makes sense to me as an audience member mm -hmm. because I'm like, I would see why he'd say that. And it's it's endlessly entertaining and it's it's heartfelt. I think the, uh, the big part of why I'll connect with that one mm -hmm. is because it's a very heartfelt story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this one is believe me it has emotion mm -hmm. like Edward has emotion but he's a he's a never ending optimist there was uh, yeah. there was uh never a point where he got down which is good um however uh I'm an emotional kind of guy mm -hmm. so I like to you know I like to see that real human like sadness that 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 uh where things get hard and how you deal with them mm -hmm. right but with Ed Wood, man, that guy is per like he uh, he is resilient as hell nothing because nothing him. did, <laughs> not a damn thing. He just kept going no matter what. Mm -hmm. And hey, that's kind of awesome, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that I don't think would connects with me as much as somebody who like you know has is com more a little more. It comes across as a little more complex. Like the fact that he's so optimistic, it doesn't seem like he has much going on in the background like mm -hmm. that he's that complex which isn't true though but he i think that because he's such an optimist he doesn't have as many uh complex emotions just because he he's always thinking like well that's fine then oh yeah no problem oh yeah no problem like he never struggles with anything it seems whereas with like tommy was oh He's always struggling with something. That guy's like constantly conflicted mm -hmm. and all over the place. So I find that super compelling. Yeah. A big part of it also too, though, about the disaster artist is obviously going to be about, you know, his spirit to, you know, continue on as well. I think that's also a big part. Yeah. And the of fact, too. yeah, the fact of like how audiences ate it up. Like, I, I yeah. think that like, yeah, that film alone had like took off in a way that I don't know that any of Ed Wood's films did, did yeah. unless it was Plan Nine. Plan that Nine, did. when Plan Nine from Mars, in terms of like it, it, those movies were in relative obscurity until about the eighties. Yeah. Um, yeah, when I was um, reading that at the end, they were yeah. saying like, oh, mm -hmm. it was at like at that point where it got rec like it started to get a yeah. whole new fan base yeah it did i did i have read reports that it would air on tv from now and day and uh, ed wood when he was still alive i've seen that when i he, think i've seen it on like tv guide yeah. and stuff like that whenever it would come on tv he would call up everyone like hey it's on tv let's watch it and all that and um yeah no he the uh, in the 80s um there was a book called i think the golden turkey award or something like mm. that and they named him the world's worst director. Mm. And that, of course, everyone's like, we got to see his movies. Well, and yeah. then Plan 9 from Outer Space became just the de facto worst movie of all time. Yeah. 
just because with just everything about that movie is just wrong. Yeah. Just, just, <laughs> there's, there's just nothing like the, the, the dialogue to the, the composition with edits, the editing, just everything. The strings. Like, oh, yeah, just everything. Stuff. Like, it makes, like, to be honest, it kind of makes the room a little bit more uh, legit in terms of yeah. its production value. Because this movie was, uh, Plan 9 was shot for, like, I don't know, like thirty grand. You gotta, you gotta also remember the days, budget, can, yeah. <laughs> the massive budget differences yeah. between. Those oh yeah, movies. oh yeah, for sure. And that's why it, it's, and that's another reason why I find this movie to be extremely like inspiration, inspirational for me is that, you know, I don't have a lot of money to make movies, so mm-hmm. you gotta just do with what you got and just yeah. roll with it, because um, in the end, it's just getting that movie finished, getting mm-hmm. that thing made, no matter what, you know. The, like one word that was um, would have summed up everything you were just describing there, Andrew, is compromise. The entire yeah, yeah, film industry yeah. is based on compromise. Mm, totally. Everything. I got to compromise. Like I might have a complete vision of how this should be and how I see it as perfect, but an actor might want as to do something a, different. As a film goer, I hate that. Honestly, because like, I, I, I know that, but I see it so much. And it's just it, you constantly wondering – Hey, how would this have been if they had, if they didn't have to reshoot, if they didn't have to do this? Mm-hmm. Like if like, cause you know, things are going on in the background and sometimes it leaks out a little bit Yeah, and you get those whiffs of it and you're like, I just wish that, you know, they could roll with it obviously to within reason. Cause you'll mm-hmm. see some people who have like ultimate creative control and go bonkers yeah. with like a massive budget or something. So I guess I can understand that, yeah. but I don't mind if somebody like creatively goes out of hand and makes something crazy and and like bad Mm -hmm. but as as long as it was their you know their their vision and they put it out there it's it'll be interesting in some way or another and if it's you know if it's not if it doesn't connect with anybody Mm -hmm. then okay it doesn't but that's kind of like that's not what art is about right so yeah i i I get you and i I hear you on that but uh the the flip side of that and the the reality of is that when there's you know, Money, when you're, yeah, when, yeah, when people are giving you millions of dollars to make pretend. Well, that's why I say within you know. reason, because like if if it's a big budget film, yeah. like I I understand that it, you're beholden to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. So, but you know, honestly, I yeah, like it's I like this film a lot. I think the only difference, uh, the only thing that holds it back from loving it as much as you, Jack is that is that difference between us yeah as and I, I think that's that's honestly a, a fair argument i i can see that i can see a flip side yeah. too with you you connecting with a certain movie so much and i'm i'm outside because I, I just don't get it uh, whether it's not saying you don't get it but just i it doesn't connect with me as i say it does with totally you. and that's i think fair. i uh, i saw a movie like just a random uh memory i have um i saw uh amour which was a um film from a few years ago i think it was like amour four years ago yeah yeah um, it came out and I watched it and I think I connected with that movie more than most of the people I saw it with or mm-hmm. everybody that I saw it with. I but really liked that movie too. I love that movie. Like yeah. that's very, very underrated for actually. Um, yeah. but I connected with it on such a deep level. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know, that makes a huge difference when you're watching a movie. Absolutely. It just does. And like, I can see it looking at you and hearing you talk about the movie that that's the way this movie connected with you which mm-hmm. is why i can't say that like i feel as strongly about it as you oh, guys absolutely. but it's a it's a near flawless movie though if you look at mm-hmm. it from a from a mm-hmm. like from all angles to be honest like it's really good yeah so the one thing i didn't touch on that i agree with you guys is damn um what's his name again bella lugosi it was martin um, lando martin lando he did a f- phenomenal job like that yeah. was uncanny i was watching that like i kept having moments where i'm like are they like putting it like are they using some other footage or something like because like holy shit it was damn good he nailed every aspect yeah. he looked exactly like him it wasn't it was really well done yeah no uh, it's like that and i was always compelled when he yeah. was on screen i think he was actually easily for me the standout like I think uh, I enjoyed him in the film more than I enjoyed, like not anything against him, but like yeah. mm-hmm. more than Johnny Depp. Like oh, yeah. I was enjoying seeing him on screen. Oh yeah, and he was the stand. Like he, like he, he swept all the awards. Like, yeah, every deserved, first man. best supporting actor, he won it. Yeah. Well, when you said like Sammy J, yeah. uh, for for uh, Pulp for Pulp Fiction, right? Like that's a damn good role. But this now having seen this. 
I totally see why. Yeah. yeah, no, it's it's yeah, no, he just he, it's when you get to know like Martin Lando and his career and just what he puts into acting and just also like some of those uh, like feedback I would hear about uh, his performance into this movie is that one actor um, told him that you like you got the Hungarian accent just right because you don't sound like an actor doing an, an Hungarian accent. You sound like an actor trying not to do an Hungarian accent hmm. because that's what Bela Lugosi was. That's was his downfall is that he couldn't escape his accent. That yeah. was sadly the biggest problem for most actors in the 30s and 40s when they switched to sound is that if they had that accent, they're stuck with it and they couldn't you know, go out and do other things. Yeah, they never learned to like do the American accent. Yeah, yeah. so that's the one thing that, you know, he... When you hear when you again when you hear Martin Lando's actual voice and you just go like holy shit like it's it's incredible and actually I don't know if you even noticed his daughter is in this movie too oh cool she plays it's uh, Loretta King the one who you oh, thought yeah. had oh, the money right. and didn't that's his daughter nice so but anyways uh, Alex <laughs> finally yeah <laughs> <laughs> hey we're talking about this movie it's great um, I have uh, one other question. Um, how do you think uh, Ed Wood sizes up against uh, some of uh, Tim Burton's more famous movies? Because I, I, I will go on a limb and say I think this is his best movie. Like, I'm a little biased. It's my favorite movie of his. But I still, I can't, even up against Edward Scissorhand or Beetlejuice or anything, I personally think this is his best movie. So, I don't know. What do you think? Hmm. I had seen this movie before. It's been 17 or 18 years so it's almost like seeing the film for the first time. The only thing I remember, the only few things I remember, is that it was shot in black and white. Thanks, Columbia Pictures. We, and <laughs> that turned out to be a great thing. Oh, I'll yeah. get to that in a minute. Martin Landau's performance. I remember Johnny Depp being in it, but I don't remember him being sponsored by Colgate because holy shit did he show his <laughs> teeth yeah. on him. But that Isn't that a Johnny Depp staple in a way though? Well, no, I, it, no, it, it, I don't, don't think so. If, you, if you've seen the actual guy though, like he had the dentures, so his teeth are always going to be out oh, of yeah. there. Like yeah. this. And you can actually hear in his voice too. Um, I think that... Yeah, you could hear it sometimes with them talking with them. Yeah. I think that it, the fact that you always, almost always see his teeth, it's almost like the, the Joker smile. Yeah. But that mm-hmm. goes to what Andrew was saying with his never-ending positivity and when you live in a place like la and you're trying to get into hollywood you have to be constantly positive and pushing forward and that's what he did and that's that's the rebellious go-getter american spirit and he kind of embodied that like the american dream Mm -hmm. that's kind of ed wood i think Mm -hmm. which is great because you you see other characters in movies, they stay, they try to stay positive, but sometimes they falter and they fall. And you see those, those moments. But as Andrew said, with Ed Wood, his mom could get hit by a train right in front of him, and he's still smiling and say, "Well, let's go on to the next shot." Yeah, he'll like <laughs> spin it some way. Some yeah. way he'll find the yeah. positivity yeah. in it. It's gonna look it's good. A never under, never ending optimist. Yeah. Yeah. And that was really interesting to see. Like he. In a, a hallway full of doors, all these doors are closing, so he just keeps going to the next one and ringing on the, the knob to see which one will open. Mm-hmm. And that's fascinating to see. Like He did eventually finish the picture. Yeah, it's a terrible movie, but he finished it. Mm-hmm. So that's despite a testament. Despite all the odds. Yeah, yeah despite you know, like, all the odds. And that's always been one of my, my big things is like whether whatever problems come up like for me it's just like i it, i'm too stubborn you need to fit i i can't just let something go bad i can't let someone go i need to mm-hmm. finish it i don't care how it turns out i need to see this all the way through otherwise for me personally it's like then what was the point yeah um so like whether it's again you have no money or you have the shitty camera or you're dealing with difficult actors or anything like that it's just it's you got to push through because making a movie is just it's it's madness mm-hmm. you're you're making decisions you're making compromises left right and center just to get the movie finished whether it's you had planned this entire day for a shot you can't get it you gotta think of something on the spot right now to to make up for it okay. and just seeing that like even like they didn't have the motor for like the this the octopus well just move the arms you got it we got to get this made we got to do it so like I, like I love that scene. Yeah, like <laughs> I, 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 when I'm no like, man, when he got in the water, that just killed yeah. me. 
Like I said, his performance, like every time he's on stream, yeah. he's just like, <laughs> Actually, it's I, fucking cold. Yeah. I, don't know, <laughs> like, I don't know if you've, if you've ever caught on. You've probably caught on, but yeah. I don't know if you have, is that I do quote, let's shoot this fucker. Yeah. <laughs> I say that all the time when I'm on set, let's shoot this fucker. And I'll say, let's shoot this fucker. <laughs> like, I, I, cause that line is just, it, it sums good. it up. All right, let's just shoot this. <laughs> let's just get it out of the way. Yeah, man, um, that, that Ed Wood's all about that one take, one and done. Oh yeah, that's, one and yeah. done every yeah. time. It's perfect. Doesn't it's matter. Perfect. perfect. Great job. Perfect. Cut yeah. print. So when Cut you, print. so Andrew, yeah. if you ever um, are doing a pizza roll for me again, if you hear me go, if you've caught on to me saying that's perfect, it's because I'm quoting this movie. It's just ingrained. Oh, I don't know, man. Oh, like, yeah. no, no, you might not. <laughs> now you know. Now you know. <laughs> now he's at the battle. Um. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah, get that in. Low hanging fruit, Jack. It's not that low for me, man. Come on. <laughs> Nothing's low for Jack. No, yeah, you're right. <laughs> for those who don't know, I'm like 6'8", so I can reach anything. And lives at. <laughs> um, yes. What did you think of the uh, Sarah Jessica Parker character? Because I, I, she's the one who actually, funny enough, has who changes the most. She goes yeah. from a very, like, Supportive. very optimistic, I almost <laughs> like Ed. And then the second she finds out, she turns into the most, like, v- like angry... What the fuck? Type well, apparently of attitude. the real uh, Dolores Fuller wasn't like that. I Her heard that too. Was not thrilled with her. And apparently, she liked the movie, but was not uh, per- mm-hmm. not thrilled with the portrayal of her character. Yeah, and I actually um the the um a lot of things were kind of taking uh they kind of went with like uh there is actually no record of Bella Lugosi just flipping out, just swearing, having swearing fits. That was probably actually uh, made up by the movie. But the um the son of a Bella Lugosi was a little uh, about that first but when he saw it he's like oh no he did a great job so he 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 learned to live with uh some of the creative liberties that the uh, writers took hmm. um actually i didn't mention the the writers of this movie um i'm gonna butcher one of the guy's last names um but it was written by scott alexander and uh larry uh Karazowski. um and they had uh, written uh they're they're known for writing the people versus larry flint hmm. man on the moon um 1408, that uh, oh, yeah. Stephen King movie. Yeah. Uh, he wrote also Big Eyes, the most recent right. uh, Tim Burton mm-hmm. film. Um, they also wrote uh, the uh, O.J. Simpson American Crime Story. Mm-hmm. That was um, so good. Yep. And then I, the, I think I'm the only one here that saw that, right? I didn't see it, yeah. yeah. And then Shit, the man, funniest credit that. I saw, which was uh, Agent Cody Banks. Oh, I've <laughs> seen that. <laughs> Underrated I've movie. Seen that. Yeah, I've seen that, too. Boy. The first Love one it. or the second one? First one. Both. Right. <laughs> I've seen both. I remember it's a double sided DVD. Man, sh- yeah. Agent Cody Banks, yeah. shout out. <laughs> oh, man. But, uh, I was going to say, though, uh, back to one of my original questions for you, Alex, mm-hmm. which was how do you think this compares with other uh, Tim Burton films? Yeah, I'd forgotten a, you asked that question. <laughs> From what I remember about other Tim Burton films, they were, I think they were a bit louder and more quirky. Mm hmm. Always. With with Howard Shore being the composer, it did set the tone quite different, as opposed to if Danny Elfman were to head the score on this. Mm-hmm. So, I think I think choosing Howard Shore was the right choice for this. It's so interesting how you choose different people for your project and how it influences the outcome of it. Oh, yeah. um, I, from what I remember of other. Tim Burton films, Batman comes to mind, of course. And that's probably my favorite one, as Edward Scissorhands would be up there somewhere. Ed Wood would not be in the top three, but I still think it's a good Tim Burton film regardless. Mm -hmm. And I think, as I said, thanks to Columbia Pictures Uh for for giving them that that idea to shoot in black and white because I think that was the exact right way to go. I thought when I first saw the film that the filmmakers had chose to do it that way because I think it really helps with the film itself. Like oh, sorry, telling that story. I, I should, I should, yeah. but it was Tim Burton's idea okay. to do it. They were having problems. They couldn't. The original was going to be in color. They couldn't figure out how to make Bela Lugosi look good in color. Yeah, yeah. And then they held the black and white photo, and they're like, "Let's make it a black and white." Yeah. And it was Columbia said, uh, "No," because yeah. uh, they. But thanks to Columbia Pictures for selling it and giving it to Disney Bonavista, and they went with black and white instead. Nice. Um, they actually um, the other thing too is uh, they allowed Tim Burton to have uh, creative control. 
Good. Because mm-hmm. they thought it was uh, it was not really that big of an investment. So they're like, eh, we can. Oh, whatever. Let the kids whatever. play. Whatever. Yeah, let the kids play. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which, um, it's, there's always going to be that hovering producer, you know, as we saw in the talk radio. He's always over the. They're always there. There's always a money man in your corner. Yep. And even the movie, there is the. Actually, I love that uh, <laughs> the, yeah. the the uh, the old movie boss uh, who. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, the other movie that I recognize him in was actually came out in '94 too. He was in a Dumb and Dumber. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's, mom. The, he's the mob, yeah. mob yeah. guy. He's the mob Aang. boss. Yeah, like, he's yeah. the one in the car when yeah, he does yeah, the most yeah, annoying yeah. sounds. Yeah. Guys, 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 guys. Oh, yeah. so great! Yeah. I didn't even realize that. No, he's he's great, and I just <laughs> it's just everything. It's just I don't know. I just. Yeah, no, I just like, like, do you have a script? Fuck no, we got a poster. Yeah, <laughs> that, that guy too. was such a quintessential like, like he was he was like the essential just make a movie for like cash in kind yeah. of uh, like money like producer. Oh yeah, definitely that production was the line guy. mentality. Like, totally, just, like, hammer well, it's just like how cheap can you do it? Like this, this, that. Like it's all shoestring, and mm-hmm. I I love that. It's it reminds me of like a I guess like a modern day version of a guy like that would be like uh blumhouse jason blumhouse or yeah yeah name? blumhouse yeah yeah blumhouse yeah he uh like yeah like although a lot more quality coming out of mm-hmm. there <laughs> yeah. now but like it's like a tight pr- production it's mm-hmm. always like low budget yeah. stuff and no. uh, you know it's like stuff like that right mm-hmm. producers like that and that's not just common for like that's not just low budget any like most studio execs are like that they don't at the end of the day mm-hmm. it's about the bottom dollar you know, you could have the most yeah. you know, artistic, profound movie ever written or ever made, but if it makes nothing, sorry, I'm not paying for it. That's basically yeah. that's as unfortunately that's the business. It even, is a movie business. Even this year, you're seeing that with like Star Wars, all the stuff that's rock Star mm-hmm. Wars lately. It's yeah. like if they're like, yeah, this is a money franchise. Like if you're going to mess something up, they're not afraid to fire you. Yeah, like right away. Like it's, doesn't matter how big a part of the film you are or how far along are mm-hmm. you like they'll if they they'll do what they have to do when you've got millions of dollars in the works you know yeah. you want to make it's that like back a, when it's a big budget like that like mm-hmm. they'll they'll do whatever right so but back in the ed wood days though i mean it you know it was like a conveyor belt like i mean the whole system it was like even more extreme than it is today because at least today they're like okay you should spend a bit longer to make these movies <laughs> instead of like three or four fucking days well because audiences have shoot. become more discerning now i feel like mm-hmm. they're less willing to spend their dollars on film yeah yeah uh that like are you know that crap they were not going to see a movie that's as crappy as a film that came out then that was like you know rushed oh yeah Yeah. and and these these movies are like the quintessential b movies and a b movie Mm -hmm. was always like they would have a double feature in the old days they would play two movies they play the feature presentation and then they play the second b movie and that's what these movies at the plan nine they were just paired on still kind of doing that at drive-ins oh yeah that's exactly what it was the, like the whole movie mentality was drive-ins or like even as they didn't have cineplexes they only had like one screen yeah. and that's what they would do they would get the audience mm-hmm. in to come in for a double bill double feature and that's where they would pair in the cheap b movies yeah because you don't need to make that much of profit so you can kind of bank off of the more successful one kind of you know, right as tailgates and all that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Although, like, uh, like you're saying, they're, they're now the drive-ins playing a, what Bad Moms Christmas. Yeah, I was just gonna say. <laughs> so I'm not sure which one's supposed to be the B movie. Here. What was the other? One? Double B movie. Jigsaw. 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 Jigsaw there's Bad a third Moms movie, Christmas. isn't there? There was only the two that there's they're mentioning because right it's it, it, there's a local drive-in and where we live and yeah. it's closing down for the season for the holidays and they were only mentioned the two. I was like, oh, yeah, I'll they kind of yeah, yeah Halloween. Run right out and, Halloween yeah. was there. I don't know. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, with uh, Ed Wood, though, with his movies, like, I had, I've only seen, funny enough, the three that they talk about in this movie are the only three I've seen. Mm-hmm. Um, I have seen Glitter and Glenda, which I actually personally think is worse than Plan 9, just because it is boring at times. Yeah. Because you saw what, you, I don't know if you remember the clip where the, the execs are watching the theater going, what the hell? And you just hear the narrator talking in the background about his, Ed Glenn's life and all that. That's literally the whole movie. Yeah. And it just gets dull after a while. But Plan 9 is just every shot, you just kind of go like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh my. <laughs> it's day and night. Day, uh-huh. night. Day, uh-huh. night. Day, <laughs> night. Bella Lugosi, stunt. Bella Lugosi, stunt. They're using that shot again. 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 Can you use a different shot? <laughs> just it, it's it's amazing, and just and then the dialogue. That's the one thing that links all Ed Wood movies together is the way he writes his dialogue. Just sounds like no one 
like no one no dialogue you could you, it's carrie fisher said it best you can read this shit but you can't say it mm-hmm. you know it's just like you can write it you can type it but you can't say it mm-hmm. and when you read his dialogue out loud it just comes off as so unnatural and just so like i'm blanking on the exact word that could characterize this but it's not realistic oh that not even close it's it's just so it's very theatrical at times you know and you, i just love those moments because those are the little the little things that i can connect with um are like when he's in the background and he's miming the actor's mm. dialogue yeah. mm. i've done that i've seen other filmmakers do that it's just it's a conscious thing when you're watching someone perform your words that you wrote in your head and now you're finally seeing it out and you're just like you had a way of how the cadence should go the timing of it and when you see the actor do it is you can't help but get caught up in it because you're just like yes it's coming to life yeah it's either like it's it's either working really well and you're doing it or it's almost like you're trying to do it to see if it's working mm-hmm. you know if you're trying to oh yeah that's along. how you can tell yeah. like if, if an actor director relationship is good if they act director likes the act means they're doing the lines well right <laughs> if they're not it depends it man like i feel like there are some directors that are like so they're almost like they're almost like comedians almost they're like cool with people just doing like uh, improv in certain certain oh, places oh yeah it's that's a, a whole nother ball game it, oh yeah, like, yeah. It's, yeah. It's comedic comedic styles. directors yeah. like especially like they'll they're like yeah just keep going until we get something awesome that's called lazy filmmaking to be perfect i don't know it like, also really okay. depends though because like, ragnarok just came out uh was his name the the uh the director from new zealand I uh why uh <laughs> Oh, it's like Tiata Taika Taika Waititi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know. I, I get, I get where you're going with that. Yeah. How that one is, is visually, it looks great and all that. No, but like the dialogue, you can tell mm-hmm. uh, they just found the best of what they came up with, and it worked yeah. really well. And it, I don't think he was being like lazy. I don't think no, that's like, fair. That's no. There's the odd exceptions, but for me, it's more or less like most, particularly with American comedy films mm-hmm. nowadays is that it's all talking heads. It's more like just point a camera at a comedian mm-hmm. and let him okay, go Okay, that's off. different. Like, no, 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 if you're that... a good comedic director, I feel like you can guide the improv in the dra- so that it produces something really good. Well, exactly. well, no, but what I mean, though, is that it's, it's not that they can't get a good product out or they can't make it funny, is that they're, they're only just pointing, the, they're not doing anything creative with the camera. They're just mm-hmm. merely doing basic setups and just letting the actors do all the work. Whereas... Mm-hmm. You have this this device called a camera that can do so many wonderful <laughs> things to make jokes or to get a laugh out of something than just relying on basic ad lib improv. Yeah. You know, when you that's why I think Thor does better because they they actually put a lot of care into the look of the movie. Like there's shots that we're still talking about that that was so cool how they did that shot, not just yeah. about the comedy. But certain other movies, uh, especially, like I said, most nowadays, you watch every, like, rom-com or buddy comedy or anything that is, you can't mistake in it for being a comedy, they all look the same. Mm-hmm. Very standard shots. Like, the only reasons why filmmakers like Edgar White, uh, yeah. Edgar Wright stand out so much is because he knows how to make his movies funny without saying a word. It's, it's, just, it's also physical comedy as well. Yeah, exactly. Right? And it's all v- visual that's, comedy, none of that's yeah. there. Visual and physical comedy, yeah. like it's it's a lot rarer these yeah, days. Yeah. The cutting is can be a uh can be a laugh. The the placement of a camera can be a laugh. Just blocking can help bring out a joke, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and I mean there's other directors too that are of course in comedy that are also strictly like by the page, like they don't deviate from the page like kevin smith obviously or even greta gerwig i found out actually she's like for Lady Bird was like mm-hmm. to the page like there's or, no improv going on or even um tarantino like he, he yeah he yeah. sticks to his word because it, it, hey if it's a good joke you're gonna keep it yeah um it's but, just different styles right yeah, some di- are okay with like oh that's you know it's bounced back and forth yeah, and it, it, like, it really depends more on just the kind of the the, the group dynamic i think because yeah too. sometimes mm-hmm. sometimes it works and sometimes it's just it's just totally not gonna depends. happen so yeah, yeah it really it's it really depends yeah. it can't it can work but sometimes yeah, it can fail horribly it, as well and it can also depend on like hey like i've written these words and they sound great and they're funny to read but when the actor even if it doesn't come off natural the actor if it doesn't sound right by the mm-hmm. how the actor talks like 
then you got you got to switch it. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. you could go through multiple drafts and this is it. This is going to be my line and you get to the day of shooting mm-hmm. and then for the first time it doesn't seem right. Oh yeah, it happens. And it happens all the time. So, yeah, no the like this said, like the entire filmmaking process is just one giant compromise after another. Yep. Making changes on the spot, on the fly. Like you you saw a big glimpse of it when we did the um, 72 hour horror fest back in April just seeing like him, me and Zach just literally just staring at a nothing and just going, okay, we can have a camera here and do this and we're done. We yep. got it. Like we have to, that's the perfect scenario for that where you have to come up with, you got to pull just shit out of your ass constantly until you got something that works mm-hmm. until you're satisfied with it because you don't have time to dwell over everything and yeah. talk about everything because there's no time and also money. Yeah. I mean, if the shit doesn't come out of your ass, you got to pull it out. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. Um, not not as much uh, defecation as I thought there would be in this movie. Yeah. No. So no. no, no. What, I meant, what I meant by like like he's he's making shit like yeah. bad movies. That was basically I was being as vague as possible. Yeah. Well, it's disappointing. He was he was let down. I think that was the. I disconnect. think that's yeah. the reason why. That's the I, reason. No, that's no, the was though, missing. Though in no, Bella Lugosi, no he did say like Karlov does not deserve to smell my shit. Yeah. <laughs> true. I love that that whole Karlov like just how bitter he is about everything. Yeah. Again, that's one of those things that that wasn't technically true. Um, yeah. Like they, they actually the they, they did actually like six movies together um, in oh, the yep. 30s, like The Rave and The Black Hat. What, was it true that he got offered the role yep. of yes, Frankenstein? That was true. And he was he offered and he said was like, no. Nah, this is too degrading yep. or whatever. Yep. Like, you know, I'm better than this kind mm-hmm. of thing. Yeah. yeah. And Karloff Fucking did actually. damn, yep. And Karloff, uh, like, like basically he did have a much better career he yes, did more he did, movies yeah. he had a longer career because well, he was the mummy too well, he was the I mean, mummy shit, like... there's um all the um Edgar Allan Poe films yep. from uh Roger Corman all mm-hmm. those ones during the later uh, years of his life but he kept doing work all throughout the 40s all throughout the 50s like if you watch um I'm gonna give a plug to Cinemasker right now uh he did a uh Monster Madness on the original Frankenstein movies um, and that's very interesting because you can see Kar- Karloff um, starting out in his first big movie and then how he became like he, he was Frankenstein for the first three movies and then he actually in the later sequels he actually became Dr. Frankenstein yes. and all that yeah. but Bela Lugosi would start coming into these uh, movies as side characters and he played like he was like Igor in like one of the original ones the one with like the uh, the broken neck and all that but his performance in those movies are some say are they outshine uh, Karloff and all that, but as the movies went on, his roles got smaller and smaller to the point where I think the last movie with Karloff and Lugosi, Lugosi's only for five minutes and he's killed off. Yeah, just barely a cameo. Um, so it, it's pretty tragic for, it for that guy. Actually, like you do feel for him. Like mm-hmm. this movie does a good job of making you feel like, man, like uh, you know, he he really does feel sp- uh, like chewed up and spit out at this point. Yeah. So at that point, it is a bit of a cautionary tale at times. You know, seeing like. You know, if you don't k- take care of yourself, you're not smart enough with, you know, this business. It can, as you said, it can chew you up. It can just destroy you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, I had something else I wanted also, to... Also, don't do drugs if you can't afford the rehab. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Don't that was... Out, or apparently. just, like, yeah. don't... Because, <laughs> like, just... Or just if you know... Don't, don't, yeah. don't shoot morphine in your... If arm. you have problems, don't do not do yeah. drugs. <laughs> he was actually... Drugs are bad, kids. Yeah. yeah. He was the first, like, celebrity to go public with going to rehab that's what they said in the film that was that was true though he was the first one to go public with it so there is an old there's actually a photo of him looking just like a just the frailest old man you've ever seen sitting there in his bed because that that whole thing was true and he like the movie um could only really do his face to make him look decrepit but if you actually see him he's got he's like skin and bone Mm. like he's there's nothing there um and yeah it is it is quite sad um and one of the reasons, actually, uh, Tim Burton was drawn to this movie, he didn't get paid for this movie. Neither did uh, uh, Rick Baker, the makeup artist. They right. did this for free because they wanted to. They wanted to make this movie. And one of the reasons why Tim Burton was so drawn to it is because it reminded about his friendship with Vincent Price during the last few oh, years okay. of his life. Um, cause they had a very similar young director meeting an old horror icon mm-hmm. in the twilight years of his twilight years of his life. Mm-hmm. And they bonded. Um, like uh, Tim Burton, he made this short uh, animated film called Vincent, which is a 
think he, I've seen that. Yeah, he made this um, before anything. This was yeah. like while he was an animator with Disney. Yeah, yeah. And it was about his love of Vincent Price. And I think Vincent Price saw it and he loved it. Mm-hmm. And they became friends. And of course, uh, Vincent Price is in Edward Scissorhand in his last movie yeah. and all that. So that's one of the things that drew him in is because that is true. The real life friendship between Bela Lugosi and Ed Wood was real. And all the things about helping him get in it took the rehab and uh, that was probably the best part of the film it's I the, heart, say, of the, it's the like, heart of the movie like that friendship was just constantly drawing me in mm-hmm. like every time you call him and you just feel it you call him and he'd say help me yeah. you know just come help me and he'd always be there for him yeah. you know no matter what he knew you know the routine at that point he was like oh it's bad but he wouldn't you wouldn't be upset at him for anything you'd always Mm -hmm. be there for him and it was like a really uh, that that was absolutely the heart of the film that was the most uh, emotional part yeah and like it sums up in like when uh he's first introducing lugosi to be in this movie and he's like like why would he be do this for you because he's my friend Mm. and it's as simple as that he's my Mm. friend and he he cares for him i think the relationship uh that was really the heart of the movie was bella lugosi and that octopus (laughs) <laughs> oh, that's that was great. I love that. They, I love that scene. That um, that's the highlight for me. Oh yeah, it's just. <laughs> uh, <laughs> fuck you! You come out here and shoot this. <laughs> just oh, just non. He's just so entertaining. <laughs> just it. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. I'll be curious to see like when uh, if we say someday we do re- revisit this movie after you've seen. The, all the actual Ed Wood movies, um, every single one. Not all. Uh, no, not all. Yeah. Of them. Um, <laughs> his, his last in the last like when he was working in the sixties and seventies, he was making straight up just porn. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what it said. It said like. Uh, new, monster, monster nudies. Monster nudies. Yeah. yeah. No, he, he wrote what a that weird. Ju- I had to read that twice. Yeah. He because he I was like, what? what? Yeah. No. He he ended up. He yeah. He 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 got. So he actually ended up dying of alcoholism. Yeah, um, That's, yeah, it said that. Yeah, I, I I read a little bit into the, the the history about like how he died. It's it's sadder than even... for such a like co- like perpetual optimist. That mm. seems strange to me. No, it, it, it like it, I guess he was hiding a lot of sadness then. Oh, obviously, well, the fact that he on, he didn't have a career until after he died. That's the well, sad that part. Too. Like that he, is sad. He yeah. never got to really experience this. This but love. But you feel for his like movies. his his love for, uh, was was the projects themselves. The fact that he was doing this, that he was doing what he loved. Yeah. I didn't know that he cared so much about recognition. Well, it's not, that, I don't know that that came across as well, much to me. Well, it's not so much as recognition. It's being successful, being financial. Like he's like Orson Welles was only yeah. twenty six, and I'm only thirty. Like he wants to be a filmmaker. He loves making movies. I think he wants just wants recognition like to the degree that it allows him to make yeah. more movies. Like I kind of agree with Andrew that like the movies themselves are seem to be more of his his passion. At least that's yeah. the impression Oh, absolutely. I got from the movie. Yeah, no, he yeah. everything was just movies, movies. He wanted to make movies and they didn't mm-hmm. even show like they skipped over some movies that he did make in between certain movies. Mm-hmm. Um there was a movie that he made in between uh, Glenn or Glenda and Brad the Monster called Jailbreak. Mm-hmm. It was just a crime drama movie or he's he wrote a couple other things for you know, he was more, he was known as the incredibly fast typist. So that's why he was able to write scripts and do it so quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no. It, and I, I keep trying to go back to this one point. Um, but uh, so what things in the film were not accurate? Like, okay. So what was well, accurate? Not accurate is what I'm wondering. Well, so cause o- like, well, the overall art, so the cross dressing oh, was true. like totally that's accurate true. Oh, because it was so prominent. Oh, There's no way you would have kept going at that if it wasn't mm-hmm. true. Oh no, that was, that's, um, that is all. That's Cause all I thought it was true. a joke at first. I thought when he told him that he was just trying to get the job, mm. I love that's that. That's what I thought what it was. There. I was like, Oh well, he's just saying anything, right? Mm-hmm. He had already said, uh, you know, I was just, I'm saying that because, you know, I, I Together. you have to, right? Mm-hmm. That's this industry. Yeah. I was like, I get that. So I was like, oh, he's full of shit. He didn't like w- cross just while he was like, like he didn't wear women's clothing while he was in World War Two. That can't <laughs> be true. And then, like, obviously he's bullshitting. And then now after seeing finishing the film, I'm like, really? Like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> did, did, did he yeah, like no, that's no, that's kind of like on, no he's on record unexpected. saying that he he fought in uh world war ii in the um i guess the uh in the pacific ocean and he went like uh parasailing like uh not parasailing um, um what, where they all drop he, off a plane and, and a par- parasailing no, 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 no uh um, he, he was a paratrooper paratrooper thank oh, you yeah. that's yeah. what i was mixing up the words um but he was yeah. a paratrooper and 
he actually, yeah, he got his teeth knocked out doing hand to hand fighting against a Japanese soldier fighting for his life. Like mm -hmm. he only got dis dishonorably um, discharged. Discharged. discharged yeah. Thank you. Um, because he got shot um, mm -hmm. in the leg. But yeah, he was terrified. He he jumped dishonorably. Dis you mean honorably discharged? No, no. Uh, oh, sorry. Yes, yeah. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> yeah, he was I was like, like wait, he got shot in the leg. Sorry, the leg and then got dishonorably. Like, yeah. What an <laughs> asshole! <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, I, man. I clearly don't belong in the army. Um, <laughs> um, no, man. That's like that's kind of incredible. Like holy shit. Like that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Actually, like oh, yeah. I I. Because I thought he was just being, like, kind of like Hollywood scummy in a way. Not, like, in a bad, like, necessary. It feels like it's part mm -hmm. of the industry. You just kind of got to say whatever. You know, that's Hollywood. Yeah. But then, like, the fact that all of that was true, I was like, whoa, that's, like, that's that's kind of, like, that's a really compelling thing. Like, mm -hmm. like it's... Eh. The fact that he, you know, it's, it's, you know, we keep bringing this up, but that's really relevant to today in a big way too. Cause mm -hmm. it's like, you know, uh, him being comfortable in his own skin in the army and like how you can't and, and how he would just find a way around that. Mm -hmm. Yet he was totally capable, obviously, that didn't make him like an ineffective soldier clearly. Yet he was able to like he had this part of himself that he had to hide, mm -hmm. and uh, but it didn't you know like it, you know he could have been open with it and been just as good of a soldier. So like I don't know I find that super interesting. Like mm -hmm. I, I it's such a th it feels like such a throwaway thing in the movie. Like they just kind of mention it and mm -hmm. then move on. But like I keep going back to that like like wow like that's a really like yeah. that's a really interesting fact. Like, well, I, really I, interesting. I think it just gives more depth to the character. You see this um, Ed Wood being so optimist, so like happy and driven, and yet you just f hear little tidbits of his upbringing, whether like his mother wanted to have a girl and would dress him up as a girl. Yeah. When you really think about it, like that's fucked up. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Or uh, like it that's is. that's psychologically that could damage a person. But you know, obviously he rolled with it. So he persevered, and yeah. like that's the thing that like, it, it, that's why I, I attached it at, like why i kind of I, i've kept going back to that because i was like that's like that makes him so much more of an interesting character to me because it's it's like he managed to do all this stuff it's really incredible mm -hmm. it makes me like have an appreciation uh for more yeah. of an appreciation for him as a as a person just yeah. because it's like wow you really did a lot like and overcame so many odds even with uh you know, kind of everybody against you in this background that's really hard, that nobody would be accepting of ever, mm -hmm. but you somehow managed to make it work. Yeah. No matter what, like that is part of the optimism that I find most compelling. Yeah, and that, and that's why I like, I find this movie to be extremely like inspirational for me. It's like no matter what's thrown at you, no matter how different you are or how strange you may seem to, other, to anyone else uh, around you, you still persevere. You still... As Orson Welles said to, by the way, that whole Orson Welles, that's bullshit. That was made up. Yeah, never, yeah, that's he never very he not never met true. Orson Welles. But that's <laughs> such a great scene, still. Oh yeah, it's... and I love that scene. It's like like visions are worth fighting for. Why uh, spend the rest of your life making someone else's dreams come true? Yeah. Uh, it's like that line alone just it hits home so hard for anyone in the creative arts, mm -hmm. whether you're a filmmaker, a writer, a song, a singer, whatever. It's just like you you need to stick to your guts you know you need to whatever you believe in and if you truly believe it you got to get it done you know that's that's the life of a filmmaker and as an artist in general that's what i love about it so much and it is and whether or not it's his drive for filmmaking or as you mentioned with uh this this the secret he was living in being a transvestite and all that like he still pushes forward like even when they were saying like you a fruit or like, like no uh, he's like, no, I love having sex with women. Like he, he's completely fine with it. Like mm. it, nothing, he tries so hard to not let things get him down. It was cool that he was directing, like, cause I just think that that makes him so like that perseverance is pretty impressive because he was like directing in, in, uh, in women's clothes. Right. Mm. And it was, it was cool, man. Like it was like to see him just kind of like own it, own everything. Yeah. And that was awesome. Cause you know, it's so hard to do that right mm -hmm. and the fact that he'll always like that's part of it just always making things work one way or the other yeah and that's that's really cool that's pretty inspiring actually no yeah no and the, and uh, i think that's a good note to to leave up uh we're near the end of our show so uh 
I will go one last roundabout for what everyone thinks. Um, I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to start with oh, Alex. Whoa. Look at you. Whoa. <laughs> I'm switching I don't things like up. Nice. I don't like this. I don't like change. We're going backwards. <laughs> I think Ed Wood is a film that should be seen by everyone. Performances, direction, the look, the feel. And once you see this film... You should see at least one Ed Wood film, be it Plan 9 from Outer Space or Glenn or Glenda. I myself haven't seen any Ed Wood films, and I think it was a really sad missed opportunity Mm -hmm. that no Ed Wood films were featured in an episode of Jack's Not Ready. (laughs) Well, the thing is, though, is I think Jack had seen them even by that point. Yeah. Well, those ones I have, but there are ones... uh, I mean, there's other ones, but they're not as, like, It would have been more appropriate for me to... You guys aren't ready for this. Um, yeah, almost because you. Yeah, yeah. You're a little more. Because I've seen Pla- I've seen Plan Nine like at least five times. Like I've, Jesus, like, really? But, but, oh, I've, but, but I've watched it. Like, so like I said, I've I've known about this film since I was like twelve or thirteen, and I didn't yeah. see Ed Wood until I almost finished high school. Why would you watch it five times? Because so. it was entertaining as fuck. Hmm? I mean, it's y- it I is. Guess, I mean, yeah. I don't know, man. Like we've seen. We've seen The Room how many times? But mm. I think, I don't know, I, I would challenge that because The Room is a very different experience. Oh, the, oh no, no. The Room, by far, is a better movie. Yes. I, I, I haven't seen, I haven't, none, I haven't watched Plan 9. Like, I haven't sat down and watched it or anything like that mm. in years. Yeah. It definitely does not have the same, like, uh, constant rewatch value as Ed Wood. Mm. Uh, sorry, as... <laughs> as, uh, <laughs> as uh, um, The Room, sorry. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, uh, it, I don't know. It's just one of those movies. Like I was, I, it was just starting, I, I, I watched Edward when I was really getting into movies and I was spending a lot of time watching great movies, best movies. This was on the worst movies of all time. Yeah. And I, I you want to see the yin and the yang. Sure. Yeah. And I watched this one and I was just so, I became obsessed with the story about it, how mm. it was made. You know, with the tipping over cardboard, yeah. gravestones, the gra- the carpet moving the ground, the day to night, the just the actor literally getting stuck trying to get out of the pit and all that. Like you can see it; it's all there. So, and for me at the time, I was really into movie mistakes and finding flubs. And this movie is just the king of this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a flub it's in every shot. Mistake. The whole entire thing is one giant <laughs> mistake. It's just like how certain just with everything it's it's fascinating and that was the i think why i kept getting drawn back to it It was just so fascinating and then when i found out about ed wood i was like i gotta see this i think that's why bad movie like people will watch bad movies like this right Mm. is because they are so fascinating like they're so bad that it 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 piques your curiosity because you're like how how like how did how did this come to be? Because you keep watching it, you're like, that's just so incredibly, like, how do you even make this mistake? Yeah. yeah. It's a morbid curiosity, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Guys like Ed Wood and Tommy Wiseau and yeah. other people like that and how bad films got made in the first place. Like, that whole thing, that... <coughs> that I, yeah. They're, they're, those films are popular because people are fascinated with that kind of thing. With, yeah. with people like that who have these weird visions, but they get stuff made anyway. And you can learn a lot from mm-hmm. watching films like Plan Absolutely. 9 from Outer Space. That's why these guys get those cult followers. That yep. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's, that's a, a weird spinoff that can happen from doing a really yeah. bad film. Like, mm-hmm. why Zoe's That's a why Ed example. Wood has a movie. That's why Tommy Wiseau will now technically have a Hollywood, like a big Hollywood mm-hmm. movie yeah. coming out about him because... Yeah. It's just fascinating. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And that's the thing about persevering, keep going with your project because you might you might not get the full value of it immediately. That's the whole problem with a lot of current uh, movies being made. They're made to try and be capitalized now. But as we've seen in history with a lot of movies is that they don't become fully appreciated until years later because mm-hmm. eventually they will find an audience. They find it, yeah. There's an audience for everything. So that's why... The drive, keep going. Edward sadly never got to live to see where his movies end up becoming. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. I, that happens for a lot of great artists, though. Yeah, I just saw Loving Vincent. So there you yeah, go. there's a, a classic one, you yep. know. So Absolutely. like, uh, yeah, it happens often, and it's too bad they don't get to see the fruits of their labor. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, uh, I think that that's what they would have wanted, though, right? Yeah. To 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 finally have that that recognition. Like people see it. Mm-hmm. eventually if it's good enough or like it's compelling enough mm-hmm. people will see it right Absolutely. people people will latch on at some point mm-hmm. any final words alex uh, any i think 
Johnny Depp's choice to play Ed Wood is kind of cartoonish. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that was an interesting choice because uh, with the, the Joker smile and the, the, pos the never-ending positivity, um, of course, that would have been decided in pre-production. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's interesting that they allowed him to play it that way because with some most of the other characters, they're not played by the actors as cartoonish as Depp's choice mm -hmm. was to play Ed Wood. But I think for this film, I think that works because I think you get you get more fascinated with Ed Wood yes. himself. Yeah, Yeah. though, no, I actually wanted to bring up because uh, uh, Johnny Depp, um, when he was asked, like, who was your inspirations for this character? Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just trying to... Uh, yeah, here we go. Um, he said that uh, his characterization of Ed Wood is a mixture of the blind optimism of Ronald Reagan... The enthusiasm of the Tin Man and uh, Casey Kasem. Casey Kasem, yeah. Casey Kasem. Oh, Casey yeah. Kasey Kasem. Um, <laughs> so it, those were the things he, he blended to create nice. his character. So I always thought that the optimism of the Tin Man, I was like, I like that. Yeah. That's good. Um, Andrew, uh, we uh, final thoughts? Yeah, so I I've, I've, think I've covered it pretty well, but... Um, yeah, I, I enjoyed this movie um, quite a bit. I liked it a, a lot. I thought it was really well made. Um, it's it's definitely, yeah, it's definitely underrated because I feel like as far as Tim Burton's catalog goes, this is like not a lot of people have seen not as not as many of people not as many people have seen this one as they have his other features. Like it's no Beetlejuice, it's no mm. Edward Scissorhands, right? It's not. It's not going to hit those levels. It's no, Alice in Wonderland. Uh, yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. Or dark, or dark Shadows. Exactly. Oh. Unfortunately, people saw those movies, but like this one, I feel like uh, you know it's garnered more of a cult status over time. But mm. it's still like, yeah, I hadn't seen it. You know, I I didn't know anything about Ed Wood, so it's it's great to to see this and and to learn more about that because it is actually really compelling. And mm. I think that I have to sit on this movie more mm. uh, to appreciate it yeah. more because like immediately after viewing it, it's like, okay, you know, I, I, I like, I know I liked it, but I need to like mm -hmm. digest this. And I found that actually the longer we sit at this table and discuss it and the more I get a chance to digest it, the mm -hmm. more I'm appreciating parts of it. Yeah. Um. So I have a feeling this, this movie might even like, imp like, I, my, my opinion of it might even increase mm -hmm. and get a little bit better. So I think, yeah, this, this is definitely, this would be, um, this would be an underrated movie. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's got, it's got a really, it's got a charm to it. And yeah, it, it's just one that kind of sits with you. Mm -hmm. So I can really appreciate that. Good choice. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree with you. It's a, it is a movie that just sticks with you, and it, it, it stuck with me for since high school, which is like, uh, like fifteen years now. Mm -hmm. Like I've been just, it's always been there, and yeah, no, it's 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 just one of those movies that just sticks with you. Um, I think Andrew uh, should do a double bill. I think he should do a double bill of Citizen Kane and Plan 9. <laughs> 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 I mean, hey, the movie you know is what? always following yeah. Citizen I, Kane. That, you know, you know what's yeah. I complete, you know what's funny? I don't know how, but it didn't dawn on me like we were having like we were arguing that uh, or just make kind of teasing Andrew he, he still hasn't seen Citizen Kane I completely forgot this movie that is a big did you not see me pointing the whole no, no, fucking no, no, movie no, 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 and looking at Andrew going oh no 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 no, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. Uh, I knew that when you were pointing it and I, I was laughing but before we watched it mm -hmm. until that scene came out when you pointed I was like oh this is gonna be great oh it's such a big thing because um, there's so many things and it leads up to that moment yeah. where they actually mean mm -hmm. yeah well yeah because like they credit Vincent D'Onofrio in the beginning and then it's oh, like oh okay I have to, I, I, have to, I have to mention one thing about that whole thing I don't know if any of you, you, you had to have noticed but his entire performance was dubbed oh yes. yeah oh yeah. yeah you could tell that's yeah it's very Star much Vincent so and his dubbing yeah like, and the guy who uh, dubbed his voice is the guy who does the voice of the brain because right, that was that the makes brain sense. right there. That makes sense. I'm thinking really the brain. Wow. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, Maurice uh, Lach... Uh, I can't remember. Lach Lach Lachacha? Yeah, something like that. Um, but the guy who does the voice... <laughs> sure. the guy, I am Maurice <laughs> yeah, Lachacha. Yeah. The guy who does the voice for the brain is basically an Orson Welles impression. <laughs> and Tim Burton was not impressed with uh, Vincent D'Onofrio's voice, so he got it dubbed. Sure. But you know what's funny is that 
in 2005, Vincent D'Onofrio wrote, directed, and starred in a short film. Um, I forget the title of the movie, but basically he, he's portraying Orson Welles yep. um, on the set of The Third Man. He is um, uh, basically, they're portraying that he's uh, five minutes Mr. Welles. That's what the movie's called because they're basically, he's in his trailer and they're waiting for him to come out. And the whole movie takes place in his trailer. He's with this actress, and he's kind of going over this I dialogue. I might have seen that. I might have actually. shown that to you. But if you ever yeah. wanted to see him actually do the voice and actually hear him not dubbed, that's a fascinating uh, little tidbit how you can kind of see his performance being dubbed and his performance not dubbed, mm. playing the same character. And Vincent does talk about that briefly in a podcast cast episode of the Kevin Pollack chat show, mm. if you want to know more about that. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, it's fascinating. Mm. Oh, yeah. Loving Vincent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, Zach, final thoughts. Ed Wood is Ed Good. I, d- I just <laughs> knew it. I was just waiting for it. And Rylan, what are your thoughts? <laughs> uh, I, I I don't know how I can how I can follow up that I think that, that just said it all right there. I love how everybody's smiling and Andrew's just his face is red. He's just not happy. <laughs> the cringe has taken over. I'm tired and I can I just don't want to put up with this shit. He's tired. He's I'm Lagosi. I love you, darling. I'm Lagosi at the octopus scene right now. Just fuck you. Wrestling <laughs> with your thoughts. <laughs> just Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna, do, best one I'm gonna do to you what he did to the octopus, man. <laughs> just thrash him just all gonna around. Thrash, thrash you around, man. Yeah. Fuck you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was gonna say um, <laughs> it would be very cool because uh, I would like to rewatch this movie with you a couple years from now, but after you've seen some Ed Wood movies, just to see the difference yeah. of now that you've seen these movies and now seeing them being reenacted it'd be interesting you you build a more a a lot more appreciation for the the craft of the film as well uh for the movie ed wood yeah it's like i've seen behind the scenes it feels like yeah like even like the intro of the movie where it zooms in on um criswell openings like like greetings my friends you have welcome Mm, and all that yeah that entire bit is lifted from bride of the monster that's how bride of the monster opens with Mm. criswell coming out or sorry might not have been bride of the monster it's actually sorry night of the ghouls it was his fourth movie they made after plan nine where he comes open and he goes and he goes like greetings my friends and he's talking and all that like all that's from Ed Wood the 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 title sequence where he goes over the gravestones mm-hmm. those of course taken directly from the opening sequence of uh, the title sequence from Plan Nine yeah. it's all mm-hmm. gravestones yeah and all that so it, yeah just even with the music like they even took like um, musical cues from um, Swan Lake. That's, um, I heard that throughout. Yeah, they slowed it down. Yeah, because though. that yeah. was the music that played in Dracula. Right. So that became basically they made it um, Bela Lugosi's theme mm-hmm. was uh, the Swan Lake music, and actually they, they had the little the little uh, quiet refrain of it at the funeral. Scene yeah. Like, oh, God, and then um, I think they also took music. Um, they lifted music from Glenn or Glenda to be uh, Ed's theme mm-hmm. throughout the movie. So when it's the most joyful and uh, triumphant music that's apparently from it, from Glenn or Glenda. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, but I haven't seen Glenn or Glenda enough to really register that yeah yeah i've only seen it once and it was boring um so yeah see plan nine uh anyways uh anything else Rylan? um uh, not really i guess see this movie um it especially if you are a fan of films and or filmmaking it will put a smile on your face and it may uh inspire you to 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 get out and work on that passion project you've been always wanting to do but haven't had just do it who cares if it sucks at least you'll be happy while making it mm-hmm. speaking of passion pro- uh, projects you should uh, send jack uh, no. some envelopes no. yeah. in, with your passion that's no. our that's our <laughs> like macaroni collages or sure like, yeah, whatever macaroni you want to send collages, uh, send your packets wrapped mail, in Nazi not even flags, envelopes whatever man just send it yeah, bras d- d- panties Oh dressing. yeah! Oh yeah! Jack likes to dress. What was that? What, what, sweaters? Yeah, what were those only sweaters if it's Angora, made of again? Angora. Angora. Yeah, there you go. Agora sweaters. Yeah. yeah. Oh, now that you see it, the next time you see an Angora sweater, you just go go. God damn it! Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's just gonna Angora ruin well, for life. Well, we don't really hang around very many seventy-year-olds. So <laughs> think that's gonna come up very often. Uh, that's true. <laughs> Boom. Boom. Shakalaka. Yeah. No, it's uh all right. Um. So yeah, that was uh, Ed Wood. Um, next episode is uh, Zach, and we're just getting into the holiday season, aren't we? Yeah, I'm going to have a joyous film uh, that's going to get everybody's spirits up. 
how many people are going to die in the film. Stay tuned. <laughs> and on that note, thank you, everybody. Uh, if, if you'd like to listen to more of our episodes or hear us go on and ramble on about various topics and films, please visit us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and iTunes, and hopefully in other places soon. Um, thank you for joining us, and until then, enjoy your night and have fun. Bye.